So welcome to lesson three. Here we start to look at the actual currency with which the cell uh, utilizes energy inside of, or for use of with regards to the multiple different processes that it's going to create and spend energy from. Uh, and that currency we call ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So when we think about the cellular processes that require energy or that use of free energy, those endergonic reactions, we need to think about the following types of work that they're going to do essentially. So there's three different categories of work that they go through. Uh, that first category being mechanical work. So any type of movement, that cilia or flagella movement, any type of cell division that moves cells uh, or moves pieces of components of cells to different places, that muscle fiber or any type of cytoskeleton movement, it's all going to be considered mechanical work. The transport work with regards to how things are moved through the cell membrane, both in and out, that's that active transport that we looked at in our last couple of lessons. That's really gonna be responsible for bringing in and putting out things that the cell and the body of that animal or of that uh, living organism really needs to utilize. And lastly, we will look at that chemical work. The chemical work is looking at supplying energy for chemical reactions. That's the anabolic pathway, right? If you recall with regards to metabolic versus anabolic pathways, chemical work refers to those anabolic pathways and those anabolic reactions. So when we think about all kingdoms of life, they do have one common main energy source and that's the use of and this uh, creation of ATP. There are many different components or compounds are energy rich with regards to creating and utilizing energy, but those carbs, fats, proteins, uh, they're not quite universal in terms of the use by all organisms. And, and the reason that if these nutrients are not available in the environment, we can still make ATP. So ATP is really important uh, intermediary energy source because ultimately at the end of the day, if carbs aren't available to a human, like that question Leo asked a couple of days ago with regards to hibernation versus crash diets and why different animals and different species utilize different energy sources to create that energy if there is a lack of one or the other thing. If we're not putting carbs into our body, we can consume fats and protein. If we're putting too much fats and protein into our body, uh, it's going to store that fat and protein for later use. Same thing with regards to carbs. So if one of those things aren't readily available, the living organism as a whole is quite good at, okay, I can't have readily accessible sources of carbohydrates. Uh, so I have to use fats or proteins. And as a result of that, there's a bit of redundancy in place that allows for those living organisms to still utilize and make energy without a specific input of something. So the use of ATP is, is an evolved characteristic among all living things because it can be created and utilized by cells immediately. So when I talk about evolve, it's going to look at that uh, support for that common ancestry slash evolution theory that you studied in grade 11. This is just one of those things that furthers that smoking gun, so to speak, that states that common evolutionary of ancestors is a thing because every single living organism, every single one, from the smallest, oldest single cellular organism to the highest, most, uh, highest, most evolved species that you can think of, every single one of those living organisms goes through cellular processes that uses or makes ATP every single one of them. No living species on this planet does not make use of ATP as an energy currency, which is absolutely fantastically beautiful when you think about the shared nature of biology across all life, all life, ATP is common. Viruses, everything. And that's one of the main arguments for with regards to why some, if you recall from last year in grade 11 biology, viruses not being alive because it doesn't reproduce in the same way, consume like all those factors, they still utilize ATP in some way, shape or form. And again, it, all living things. So it's quite interesting the way that it works. So what is the structure of ATP and how does it work? Let's take a look at each of those components. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And so for those of you that are able to kind of see how it, uh, the name fits together, you can start to see some of the structural components. There's three phosphate groups. The triphosphate lends itself to three phosphate groups. They are all negatively polar charged molecules or ions. <laughs> Excuse me. So they can act in a very specific way with regards to polarity. 
there's going to be a ribose or a sugar molecule. Uh, and you'll start to see the importance of that as we move through that with regards to carbohydrates. And then lastly, there's an adenine nitrogenous base. So all of those three things come together to make that adenosine triphosphate. So recall that hydrolysis is a reaction that involves the addition of water and to separate larger molecules. So when you think about ATP, we're going to utilize it to, to, to basically provide free energy for the cell to go about its business and perform any actions that work that we looked at in terms of those three table lines, I guess you could call them above. And in order to get that energy that's stored, you need to use water. So the reaction is what's called exergonic. Again, we're going to see that come up time and time again with regards to it. Exergonic meaning that it releases free energy. Again, recall, exothermic and endothermic relate to chemical energy as a whole. The reaction that produces energy that can be utilized by the cell or free energy is considered exergonic. So that delta G is going to be negative as a result of any reaction that involves hydrolysis of ATP. So the hydrogen remains in the solution while inorganic phosphate, or that PI, is usually transferred to a reactant molecule to allow another reaction to occur. This process of attaching a phosphorus group to an organic molecule is called phosphorylation. So the idea of phosphorylation is going to help us understand how that ATP is both created and utilized in order to create that free energy. So the energy is quite high in ATP because of the three phosphate groups. And those three phosphate groups are negatively charged. So again, recall what that means. If these three negatively charged phosphate groups repel one another due to like charges, the bond between the beta and gamma is very weak and easy to break. This allows for that release of free energy. So that high energy in ATP is because those phosphate groups are negatively charged. And as a result of that negativity, you can utilize it to create free energy because they repel each other in some way. And then those alpha or those gamma and beta bonds are easy to break, but they still store a lot of chemical energy as a, on account of them being covalent bonds. So we're now going to look at what's called ATP and energy coupling. The key, oops. The key thing to think about with regards to ATP and energy coupling is that when we think about exergonic or endergonic reactions, they can be coupled together so that free energy from exergonic reactions can be used to kind of power those endergonic reactions. And in the idea of ATP formation, we're going to use energy to create energy, essentially, right? That idea of spending money to make money or spending energy to make money. So the, the aspect of one releases free energy for another to use. When that phosphorylation occurs, that reactant gains that phosphorus group or that PI, and it becomes more reactive. And the more you add on to it, the more reactive it becomes and the more energy it stores up. So many enzymes have regions that bind ATP to break down one of those phosphorus groups and create a free phosphor, uh, like that phosphorylation reaction. And they also have an active site to bring the reactant close into close contact with that phosphate group. The goal here is to lower activation energy. Now I, I'm gonna spend a bit of time just hovering over this because everything we've learned in the last two and a half days is, is coming together now to really help hammer home the point that in order to lower that energy, that activation energy, we need to have enzymes in place and we need to have enzymes working. And why would we want to lower that activation energy? Well, the lower activation energy allows for us to expend less energy to make ATP. And then that way, the net gain of energy when we create ATP is going to be higher than the amount of energy we put into it. So that net gain is a positive. So again, the whole point of these enzymes is to lower that activation energy. So what would happen if we do not have any enzymes to help with regards to those reactions? Well, without ATP, the single reaction to join these requires an actual net input of free energy. When we look at that glutamic acid and that ammonia, uh, 
to make a glutamine, which is an amino acid component that we need to utilize, it's going to require energy, right? It's going to be an endergonic reaction. It's going to require that free energy input. The problem with that is, is now we're spending too much energy in order for that to happen. So with ATP, two reactions can be coupled and both result in a net release of free energy. So when you think about that glutamate and that phosphorase group, and then when we think about it in terms of that, oops, I'll just clean up all that there. When we think about that in terms of coupling it or binding it to that ammonia, we now have a release of that phosphorus group. That phosphorus group is a release of free energy in the cell due to that bond that stores that energy. So when we start to encounter and utilize ATP, we're now looking at what would normally cost an input of free energy for a reaction to take place. We're now looking at a generation of free energy for the use of that cell. So this becomes more reactive, that glutamine becomes, or glutamic acid becomes more reactive as a result of that phosphorylation, that phosphate group being attached. So that way it can be not only utilized to, uh, and to catalyze that reaction to that ammonia, but it can also release free energy for the cell. So that reaction energy is supplied by that ATP hydrolysis, and we ultimately have a release of free energy into the cell. So you can start to see why enzymes come together, why our understanding of exergonic and endergonic energy comes together, and how important it actually is for ATP as a whole to function the way that it does, because what would normally cost a large input of energy, that free energy, to form reactions that the cell needs to do its day-to-day -day work, it's actually now going to create free energy with the use of that ATP, ATP molecule. So how is that ATP molecule created or utilized? We're gonna look at that throughout the course of this unit, but to kind of give you a brief overview of the ATP cycle, we're gonna look at the steps and kind of processes that, that it goes through. So ATP energy coupled reactions, they power most reactions in our cell, if not the vast majority of them. So ATP is, is needed all the time within cells. So these cells need to consistently regenerate that ATP and that ATP needs to be regenerated quite quickly because, because those cellular processes are happening so frequently, so often with, on mass, think about it, the, the hundreds of millions of cells in your body that are consistently going through hundreds of thousands of reactions, ATP needs to be generated quite quick. So ATP hydrolysis, the ATP hydrolysis is an exergonic reaction. Therefore, ATP synthesis, the opposite reaction, must be endergonic. You have to put that energy in to get that energy out. That process happens at least, at least 10 million times per second. 10 million times per second in one cell. And when you multiply that by the factor of how many cells there are in the human body, you're looking at hundreds of billions of trillions of reactions per minute, let alone per, per day when you think about the, the scheme or the, the, the scope of it all. So it's, it's a process that's quite important. And it's probably the process that happens the most in any cell or any person overall the, the course of its life. So when we look at that endergonic reaction, free energy needs to be utilized and it's free energy is required in order to make it. It's actually going to need 30.5 kilojoules per mole to make that ATP molecule. So the exergonic, the free energy that's released, that delta G, is going to be approximately about 30.5 kilojoules as well. So you're probably thinking to yourself, whoa, 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 hold on. You're putting the same amount of energy in and getting the same amount of energy out. What's the deal here? Well, this is going to add on to a reactant, that phosphorylation, that creation of that ATP molecule. You need to add on to a reactant in order to help make those reactions exergonic. So the consistent adding on to that ATP, it builds up over time in terms of that if it was just adenosine single phosphate, whichever monophosphate, then it wouldn't be having enough energy stored into to create that, that general gain of it, right? So the amount of energy that's required and the amount of energy that's released, while equal, there are so many other factors that contribute to the lowering of activation energy. And when we look at how ATP is made, the specific processes and everything that comes together for that ATP to be created, we'll start to see how that energy gets saved as a result of many different processes. So take a look at the 
Oops. So take a look at the homework questions, section 3.2. Uh, feel free to look over these notes and ask questions, and I will stop recording here and take any questions you might have.